discussion. Our next speaker is Larry Temkin, who's professor in the Department of Philosophy at Rutgers. Uh, he was one of the very first philosophers to start working systematically on prioritarianism, and indeed, he coined the term. So, um, okay. let me uh, as we'll get we'll get Larry's up. I, I, I don't have one. Oh. So I want to tell you Larry, what Larry works on, and I'm going to read something from what I've given here. And I just want to provide the context, which is, you know, philo we're, philosophers are very sensitive. A lot of outsiders think we just work on this sort of mushy gunk that really doesn't make any sense, right? So that's the background. Here's, here's what Larry specializes on. Larry, you'll enjoy this. So, uh, his research has focused on equality, practical reason, and the nature of the goo. <laughs> That's the nature of the good, what makes for a good life or morally good, but it's the nature of the goo, so tell us about some goo. <laughs> Thanks very much. So I, before I start today, I have uh, two quick things. I wonder if I could ask you five to move here, um, because I'm one of those few speakers who actually tries to make eye contact with everybody, and it'll be harder on me if I have to turn towards you guys. Uh, you guys are all in the right direction. And second, I know it's been a really long conference and a long day already, but, um, but we shouldn't let that stop us from doing what we really need to do, especially under these difficult circumstances, which is to thank Dan and Ole and Francesca. Where is she, Francesca? You must be here somewhere. Um, for, all, for really organizing and running this amazing conference under the most difficult circumstances. And now you can start my time. <laughs> All right, so I'd also like to thank uh, them for inviting me to speak, and I'm pleased to note that this is my third annual conference for the program in Ethics and Health. And then I'm on the Olympian cycle, speaking once every four years. I infer from this that it takes Dan about three years to forget how my previous talk went, <laughs> suggesting that my talks are probably about only twice as painful as natural childbirth. So given the nature of this conference and time constraints, I shall only touch on rather than argue for several unrelated points that have a bearing on this session's topics and on the conference topic more generally. Further defense of these points must await discussion or another occasion. Also, I note that some of my points have been addressed previously. This was inevitable, but not wholly unwelcome, as hopefully there are points worth repeating. Preliminary remarks. This is an important political issue that I shall not address. This considers the question of under what circumstances, if any, a government may legitimately impose responsibilities upon its citizens when many of them don't wish to bear those responsibilities. Alternatively, to what extent, if any, is a government permitted or required to instruct, cajole, entice, threaten, or coerce its citizens to do something that they don't want to do in pursuit of a laudable goal? Similar question might be raised about international organizations like the World Health Organization, the International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank. To what extent, if any, might such organizations instruct, cajole, entice, threaten, or coerce individual sovereign states to do something that they don't want to do in pursuit of a laudable goal? For example, would it be permissible for the World Health Organization to tie the receipt of important medical aid to the adoption of an appropriate plan of universal health care coverage? Or might the International Monetary Fund or World Bank make it a condition of an international loan for help with infrastructure, education, or solvency that the country also implement universal health care coverage? Alex, I gather, is going to address these questions, or partly, and we may return to them in the final session as well. But as I indicated, I will not address them here. Arguably, such questions are premature before we've determined whether or not universal health care coverage in developing countries is even a desirable goal, and if so, what sort of coverage and in what circumstances. This approach naturally raises the question whether my discussion is an exercise in ideal theory where the thought is that we first try to get clear what the ideal health system would look like in the developing world, and then we see how close we could approach such a system in the actual world. But I enter three cautionary remarks about thinking about our problem in this way. First, we must not let the ideal be the enemy of the good. 
It's all too easy and common to point out how practically we will never be able to achieve the ideal situation in healthcare and to infer from that the whole enterprise is hopeless. Such thinking is often transparently self-serving on the part of those who stand to gain little but lose lots in any transition towards a more desirable outcome. Such thinking is also deeply problematic in ways that I don't need to elaborate, even if it's impossible practically to wipe out all murders, rapes, famines, or wars. That's hardly reason not to do anything at all to alleviate such maladies. Second, we should not assume that there is a single ideal approach to healthcare in the developing world, as many of you know. Indeed, even if there are common goals worth pursuing, significantly different approaches may be best suited to accomplishing those goals, given differences in the social, cultural, historical, political, and economic situations of developing countries. In this realm, as elsewhere, we should be deeply wary of the one-size-fits-all approach that Procrustes took with such disastrous results in fitting his guests to his iron bed. Third, we need to bear in mind the economist's important results regarding the theorem of the second best. It has been convincingly shown that for many problems, the second best solution may look radically different than the first best solution. Thus, if the ideal healthcare system is politically or practically unattainable, the second best healthcare system may look nothing like it. Last preliminary point. In what follows, I will put some points in terms of minimizing dollies which would also apply to maximizing qualities. Some random thoughts to consider thinking about universal coverage. Since this panel is supposed to be addressing concepts, requirements, and standards of equity, perhaps I should say a few words about why I shall say little about that. The notion of equity is too broad, I think, to be of much use in this discussion. In terms of the issues we really need to address, if someone describes a solution as equitable, they might mean that it's reasonable, impartial, just, unbiased, even-handed, justifiable, or fair. The latter notions are synonyms for the notion of equitable. The problem, of course, is that this gives us virtually no guidance whatsoever regarding what substantive policies actually are reasonable, impartial, just, unbiased, and so on. Utilitarians will insist that their answer to such questions about healthcare meets those criteria, as will Kantians, contractualists, virtue theorists, care theorists, Marxists, and libertarians. I'm afraid there's no substitute for putting one's substantive views on the table about what criteria an appropriate system of healthcare should meet in the developing world and arguing about those criteria head on. Hoping to defend one's favorite approach by appeal to its being equitable is likely to persuade no one who doesn't already favor that approach. And will almost certainly be rightly judged as just begging the question against rival approaches, whose proponents will undoubtedly insist that their approach is equitable. So in thinking about today's topic, I think one needs to simply focus on all of the factors, whatever those are, that seem morally relevant and significant for assessing the desirability of different health systems in the developing world. In doing this, we might determine the circumstances, if any, in which some sort of universal coverage would be best. Now, some of you know I'm a pluralist. Since any national health system will have enormous implications for a wide range of moral, social, and political issues, there will be many factors to consider in determining the best health system. This will include many crucial factors that lie outside the narrow domain of health. Thus, adequately assessing this topic will require giving due weight to such considerations as freedom, autonomy, utility, priority, absolute justice, perfection, equality, which I understand is comparative fairness, virtue, and communitarianism. With more time, I might explore how each of these factors, and others as well, might have a bearing on this issue. Instead, I'll just assert that each needs to be considered and given its due weight, if any. Clearly, this will be no easy task. I suspect that some who think about the desirability of universal health coverage do so in broadly utilitarian or perhaps prioritarian terms. In doing this, they may insist, implicitly assume that the push towards universal health care fits nicely with the focus on minimizing dollies, 
adjusted for the overall levels of people affected if one's a prioritarian. Which dominates, as you know, much of the contemporary discussion of global health. But as global health experts can tell you, including everybody in this room, the push for universal health coverage is directly at odds with minimizing dollies, whether or not these are weighted to reflect prioritarian concerns. One simple reason for this is the well-known problem of last mile communities. The simple fact is that in the developing world, where medical and economic resources are scarce, where the need for adequate medical care is enormous countrywide, and where a large proportion of the medically needy typically live in just a few large cities, often in overcrowded slums, and where roads, electricity, clinics, hospitals, and other crucial elements of infrastructure, not to mention trained health professionals, may be poor or non-existent in outlying areas. It will often be terribly inefficient in utilitarian or prioritarian terms to cater to the medical needs of last mile communities or any communities, for that matter, outside of the major cities. Thus, achieving universal coverage in the developing world will often be at odds with reducing the national or global burden of disease as measured in terms of minimizing dollies. Accordingly, pushing for universal health coverage is at odds, and rightly so, I would suggest, with simple utilitarian or prioritarian approaches to health care. And with the approaches to healthcare dominating current discussions of global health and international development. Does this mean that we should reject the utilitarian or prioritarian approaches entirely? Of course not. Such approaches reflect important values that we want our approach to health to reflect. But there are clearly other values that we also want our approach to healthcare to reflect, or the notion of universal health care coverage wouldn't be so appealing. And we need to figure out what those values are and how much weight to accord them in our final deliberations. Here are a few candidates worth considering, which I can't elaborate on here given time. One, absolute fairness or justice. We may think that fundamentally decent people should fare well and that it's unfair or unjust when they don't and that this provides a reason of what I've called reason of justice in this case of absolute justice or fairness, to rectify the situation if we can. And the key point is that reasons of justice don't vary depending upon whether or not one lives in an outlying village or a major city. Equality, understood as comparative fairness. We may think that it's unfair or unjust for some to be worse off than others who are no more deserving than they. And if we do, we may think that this provides us with reasons of comparative justice or fairness to rectify the situation if we can. Here too, the thought is that many of those who need medical care in outlying villages are no less deserving than their city counterparts and that this provides us with an important reason to address their health needs if we are going to address the health needs of those in the city. Three, equality of opportunity. Resting, perhaps, on a fundamental normative view that all normal people have equal moral worth or equal moral dignity or are deserving of equal consideration and respect. Combined with the view about the moral significance of autonomy, such a view may imply that it is morally important that all people have an equal opportunity to formulate and follow a meaningful life plan of their own choosing. This applies to people regardless of their race, religion, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, and so forth. And it also applies to people regardless of where they happen to have been born or live. Accordingly, insofar as seriously ill health adversely affects an individual's ability to formulate and follow a meaningful life plan of her own choosing, there will often be reason to address her ill health wherever she happens to live. Four. Political equality. Many believe that legitimate governments have an obligation to treat their citizens equally before the law, equally in terms of their political rights, and equally in terms of the extent to which the government promotes the autonomy and flourishing of its citizens. Insofar as this is so, there's significant reason for the government to ensure that to the extent that the government provides health care access to some of its citizens, 
for example, those living in major cities, it should also provide access to the rest of its citizens, for example, those living in smaller cities or rural areas. Five, compassion. A fundamental virtue possessed by individuals is the virtue of compassion. Insofar as the state should aim to reflect the deepest concerns of its citizens, it's reasonable to think that virtuous citizens will want the state to echo its compassion in the treatment of its citizens, or perhaps even in the treatment of anyone within its borders, citizen or not. But compassion will be evoked equally by anyone who is equally ill wherever they live. This, too, might provide some support for universal health care coverage, even in so-called last mile communities. Notice, no one working in global health has seriously proposed that we kill perfectly healthy humans so as to be able to aid more people by distributing their body parts. Key word there is seriously. There's a reason for this. Such a proposal would be morally outrageous. This shows that we're already recognized that the aim of minimizing dollies needs to be constrained by such deontological considerations as the prohibition against killing the innocent or respecting people's fundamental right against non-aggression. And hence, that a purely utilitarian or prioritarian approach to thinking about health care is unacceptable. The question is simply whether or not other factors, moral factors, may also constrain or impact the extent to which our policies regarding health care should be guarded by utilitarian or prioritarian considerations, or the idea of minimizing dollies. I've suggested a number of competing factors that we may also want to give weight to. Before going on, let me make several points regarding the foregoing. First, I've suggested several factors that might, in principle, lend support for universal health care coverage in developing countries. But even if this is so, it doesn't follow that such coverage will be desirable, all things considered. Second. Ultimately, a concern about absolute justice or fairness may depend on a robust conception of free will that's very difficult to defend. Third, even if one believes in the moral importance of absolute or comparative fairness or justice, as I do, didn't want to listen to me, did you? It's OK, don't mind. Uh, as I do, now I've lost my place. That's why I didn't want you to do that, OK. Um, for the reasons that W.D. Ross clearly identified, it may not be desirable for the state to aim at promoting such notions via its policies, as doing so may require much more information about people's past, present, and future actions, character, and well-being than it would be practical, desirable, or even possible for the state to possess. But fourth, even if there's no chance that the state could actually promote perfect absolute or comparative fairness or justice, the state might do better in terms of promoting fairness and justice to follow the policies that adopt the simplifying procedure that most people are equally deserving than to simply ignore entirely any considerations of fairness or justice. As time is short, let me just briefly touch on a few other points regarding the desirability of universal health care coverage in developing countries. First, a point that's been touched on before. An important question concerns the relative merits of single-tier versus two-tier systems of coverage, or three-tier or four-tier. There will be powerful communitarian reasons and reasons of social solidarity to favor a single-tier system. Doing so may also significantly increase the resources available to address the health of the poor, assuming that the rich will be more willing to pay more taxes for improved health benefits for all if that's the only way of receiving high quality health care for themselves and their families. On the other hand, important considerations of freedom and autonomy may push strongly in favor of a two-tier system. A single-tier system may encourage a black or gray market in health services. Rich people may choose to leave the country if that's necessary for them or their families to receive high quality health care. And there may be a brain drain of qualified medical personnel if rich people can't pay for their services in the private sector at comparable rates to those paid in wealthier countries. Second, in thinking about the desirability of universal health care in developing countries, another point we've often made here, it's crucial not to lose sight of why we care so much about health in the first place. 
good physical and mental health is fundamental for human flourishing, for human well-being, for an adequate realization of our capabilities and functionings and so forth. But as we learn from Sir Michael Marmot and others, many people in this room, good health is inextricably connected with a host of so-called social determinants. And many of those social determinants and other factors as well have similar claims on being fundamentally important components of human flourishing. To truly flourish, humans need a good diet, education, good jobs, clean air and water, support of infrastructure, protection from the elements, self-respect, respect from others, protection from criminals, protection from war and persecution, the ability to develop their highest capabilities and to achieve their highest goals, and so on. Each of these factors is crucial to human development and flourishing. Each requires significant levels of social support, and each will be in stiff competition for the limited resources of developing countries. Hence, as laudable as the goal of universal health care coverage may be, it is crucial that any plan that is implemented not crowd out even more worthy policies achievable with the same expenditures of resources. To cite just one example, it might be more cost effective in terms of promoting human flourishing to build schools in remote villages and to train and pay for qualified teachers than to train the necessary health professionals and build the necessary infrastructure to provide universal health care coverage in remote areas. The problem of trade-offs between valuable ideals and goals is always complex and difficult, but it's especially pressing in the developing world. I don't need to tell you that. However desirable a policy for universal health care coverage may be, in its own right, we must not lose sight of the trade-offs that would ensue were such a policy actually enacted. However well-intentioned, one must guard against delivery mandates that are unfunded or unfundable, or worse, still, insisting on policies that would have disastrous side effects were they to be funded. Let me conclude with two observations drawn from my recent book, Rethinking the Goo, apparently. <coughs> First, I think there's good reason in this domain and many others to adopt what I have called a cap model for moral ideals. On this model, one must not only give each factor relevant to assessing outcome its due weight, one must make sure that one avoids giving undue attention to any one factor, no matter how important that factor may be. So even if health were the most important factor for human flourishing, once one pays a certain amount of attention to addressing health concerns, it will be crucial to turn one's attention to other important concerns, such as education, jobs, safety, self-realization, and so forth. And this will be so even if this means leaving some fundamental health problems unaddressed, and even if health is the most important issue. Second, this is the most troubling thing. I am convinced that there is no coherent approach to thinking about health care that could, even in principle, fully capture everything that we believe should be captured when we think about such issues. Inevitably, this means that we have to settle on approaches to our problems that we know are inadequate in important respects, threatening those approaches with instability. This is, I believe, an inevitable condition of the social, political, and normative realms that we must face square on and come to terms with. Ultimately, then, we must seek our solutions to what Aristotle might have called phrenesis, practical wisdom, or judgment, rather than some formulaic model, whether maximizing or not. Alas, if I am right, no matter how wise we are, any proposed solution is doomed to be partial, unsatisfying, and open to serious objections. But we must not let that stop us from doing the best we can in thinking about matters of urgent global importance. Bearing in mind all of the ideals and factors that are morally re relevant, we would like to develop an approach to health care that is truly equitable, whatever that means. Whether such an approach will involve universal coverage in the developing world is, I believe, at this point, still a very open and difficult question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.